Yeah, we're going to record you, Tim. All snazzy razzy. All right, so um, I'll probably keep doing some of the Delta General stuff, if that's okay. Um, I'm glad to do questions. The one thing I'll probably start with is there are two adult and general cases which will probably be added later in the week, uh, which uh, you guys probably should be aware of and we can, we can talk about. So there's uh, a patient who is going to probably have a pulmonary valve replacement uh, late in the week here who is an endocarditis patient. So um, uh, this is a patient with centrology of the world who had a uh, bioprosthetic pulmonary valve about 10 years ago who has a pacemaker and actually came in the hospital uh, at Johns Hopkins about a month ago with sepsis and grew E. coli from his blood, which is kind of unusual, and uh, was diagnosed with essentially a uh, E. coli pacemaker infection. And his pacemaker was removed and put back in within a week. And we don't usually quite do it that way. And now we came back here with fevers and um, got admitted to the adult side. He's been sitting on the adult side for about a week or so. And again, grew E. coli from his blood. Uh, and uh, yes, Friday, he had his pacemaker extracted. And so now he's sitting here with no mechanical stuff other than the fact that he has an RVPA conduit, which isn't working as well as before. So we're suspicious that um, he has endocarditis with his conduit. So um, he is likely going get a, um, a, pulmonary, a new pulmonary valve. The problem with this uh, is that um, you don't completely know when you clear the infection, and so the timing for this is a little bit difficult. And the adult cardiology service actually wants to do it today, you know, and wants to move it as quickly as possible. We would rather sit for a couple weeks on IV antibiotics, different right ways to, to do things. Uh, but you worry that if you go back in and replace the conduit that you're just going to it again. Uh, uh, and uh, so that may come up when you guys take care of this patient. Why are we doing this right now? And, and the answer is um, nobody really knows the best timing. Blood cultures are weird. So when we talk about the pulmonary valve replacements, usually, and I'm trying to see if we have anybody in right now, but the usual situation we get is a 30, 40, 50 year old who had. Uh, Tetralogy repaired when they were young, had long-standing pulmonary insufficiency. And the thing we struggle with in the, in the TETS especially is when we decide to do the pulmonary valve replacement. And um, the classic indication is somebody becomes symptomatic. Uh, what we struggle with is when we do MRIs and we just see that the right ventricle is enlarged. And we had, and we always, a lot of you guys, when you take care of these patients, you look and say, what are these symptoms? And we had a patient a couple of years ago who was completely asymptomatic had a large right ventricle, and then had a, um, a bad neurologic outcome. And so everybody wonders in that situation, we took a symptomatic patient and you operated, and so what was going on with that? And the reality is, is that we, there are differences of opinion as to when to replace the pulmonary valve. The concern is that if you wait until the right ventricle gets enlarged and poorly functional, that in the long run the patients have increased risk of dying suddenly with ventricle tachycardia, or they get uh, damage to the right ventricle such that they can't recover once you do the valve. And if anybody took care of our little girl from um, Africa uh, a couple days ago, she was a late TEP repair. So she was, I don't know how old she is, she's 9 or 10 years old or something Eleven. like that. 11. And how did she do the first post-operative night? She needed a lot of blood products. So she was sick. She was sick. As heck. You know, a tech repair we think usually pretty straightforward. I don't know, what, what's our optimal age to do a tech repair? It's probably four to six months. So if we do it three, at one week, like over here, right behind me, uh, then they're really sick. If you do it when they're older, they're really sick. So that's why we like this window of four to six months for the tech repairs. And so if we take a pulmonary valve replacement, who you kind of wait too long, they can be a little bit sicker too, just like this patient, just because the right ventricle is going to be sick. So they, they're going to have a RV that's deaf that may require a lot of volume and maybe be difficult to take care of. Um, but uh, my indications for sending buddy, somebody for a pulmonary valve replacement are always if they're symptomatic. So if they're short of my breath and doing stuff, I think that's a good indication. The problem is, is that we get a lot of, a lot of all of my patients are short of breath. Uh, all adult patients 
that I see complain of chest pain and shortness of breath. And so it's hard to sort out uh, symptoms from what's really going on. So the classic thing we get is kind of a young, I want to be careful here, but it's usually a, it's usually a, the young female patients come in with lots of symptoms sometimes. And I'm short of breath, I can't do anything. And um, you do all the tests, the right ventricle looks perfect. Normal right ventricular size, normal right ventricular function, none of these other criteria they had talked about. There are all these symptoms. And then, so the question is, do you do the pulmonary valve replacement for that indication? So the two, the different scenarios are a patient who has a bad looking right ventricle and has a lot of symptoms. And that's pretty straightforward, you send for surgery. Then the other situation, you have a patient who has no symptoms and good looking right ventricle. So that's a pretty easy situation, you don't do any. The two overlap situations are you have a patient who has no symptoms but a bad looking right ventricle or a large right ventricle or if you have a patient who has symptoms and a good looking ventricle. And those are the patients where we always a little bit don't know quite how to handle it. The patient who has symptoms and a good looking ventricle, you're pretty much stuck doing the best because you say it's a class one indication if somebody has shortness of breath that you should do it. In my experience, the patients are cured for about six months. And then they come in, a few of my patients, the young patients I told you about, who are symptomatic with the ventricle, they're cured for a few months, and then they come in six months after the surgery and say, my valve has fallen apart, I feel exactly the same as I did before the valve. You do an echo and the valve looks perfect, you say everything looks good, and they go, okay, they go away and come see you back. Uh, or, you know, come back as scheduled. But, uh, so, it's a little bit of a, it's a little bit of, there's a temp just temporary placebo with the back, but still, they have symptoms for a little bit stuck doing it. Uh, the other indications for doing a valve replacement are something like this endocarditis case. And it's very, very difficult to clear um, infection from either a, a prosthetic or a bioprosthetic valve. It's not native tissue, it doesn't have normal vascularization. So you, you know, probably at least half the time where we have to do, um, we have to uh, end up doing surgery. And we can't, in this case, the patient already has a pre-existing valve, we can't put a melody valve in this patient because it's infected. You know, you, you obviously that would be the preferred thing, but if you put a melody valve in, you're just going to infect the melody valve. So all this, this patient going on later in the week is probably a candidate uh, for a melody valve. Like based on the size of the valve and what they have, we have to go back in and do surgery. So the indication for surgery is this guy's got a probably infected conduit. He has no pacemaker right now. He's not pacemaker dependent. He's going to get a valve, and then he's going to come back in um, uh, a couple of weeks. What kind of arrhythmias has he been having, Tim, that he needed the pacemaker? He has sick sinus syndrome. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that he had a distant history of VT, and I think it actually is a distant later. So, okay. Uh, if we look at if we look at from a rhythm standpoint, what he could do post operatively, mm -hmm. he could do um, he could show the six sinus stuff because he's had that before. That will be hopefully relatively easy to deal with because he would likely have temporary face or at least. Um, there is some data that the biggest one of the bigger risk factors of patient having ventricular tachycardia uh, after tetralogy flow is how many surgeries they've had. Uh, so the more surgeries, the higher risk of ventricular tachycardia. Unsure why that is, it's probably so. somebody who's having a surgery probably has a bad ventricle. So if you have a sick right ventricle with scar, that's increased risk for ventricular tachycardia. Um, and um, also probably repeated bypass runs, repeated scar, probably increases risk. So this patient could could have ventricular tachycardia post-op, and I'll have the chance of that happening probably five or ten percent, something like that, because he's done it before. Often, as you see, we sometimes stir things up a little bit when we do these surgeries, so it wouldn't be too surprising if he had some sort of a trick attack that we hopefully wouldn't have to do a whole lot about, but he did have some PVCs and some both runs of things. That so you'll tell them to make sure the wires are nice and secure? Yeah, we need to have, he needs to have good wires. Yeah. So. <laughs> and he might not be a great one to take to the um, cafeteria for <laughs> tell us, tell the rest of us too. So, um, not saying patient names, there's just
gentleman who had both aortic and pulmonary valve replacement, and he had also had work on his mitral and uh, mitral and tricuspid valves, and he had a lot of pain issues and we were dealing with that, but he was recovering and was activated and was kind of walking around. And the, it was a, I was on call, it was Saturday, that was a call on Saturday, and Saturday morning, he, for one, whatever reason, it was decided that he could have back problems, so he went he was then escorted him down to the cafeteria for back problems, and he was fine, he came back up. And later that morning, he went into the car block and had a arrest. Uh, probably unclear for why he had it so late, it's probably related to the like valve replacement, but he uh, ended up with a temporary case of room, so everybody was just happy that it did not happen. But he was, was he over here having had problems, or was he over at the other place? He was at Maine, so that was a little bit of a fiasco. So, uh, but uh, this guy may be a good one to keep on the unit. Uh, Is he the one you had to put the transvenous pacer in? Yes. Okay. Yes. So you know we now have the transvenous pacer in the sheath. Yes. They're here. Yes. I okay. Went over to the, I went over to the CC, the 7D, to find out which one was the right one. So okay. Well, so. It's in the equipment room down here, guys. Same place as the IO, if we should need it. The, tr the kit for the transvenous pacer, the sheath, and the pacer itself. Yeah, so that we could use use it if we need to. The other, other case that is likely to is a, a woman who I think is 35 or 40 who has Williams syndrome. Do you guys remember what Williams is? Mm -hmm. We take the care of these babies a few times a year. So Williams syndrome is uh, genetic syndrome, obviously, where you uh, the baby the heart problems that they have are um, usually supervalve aortic stenosis and branch pulmonary artery stenosis. They have some degree of developmental delay. They have facial dysmorphisms. The thing you'd learn they teach in medical school is they have what's called a cocktail party personality, which means they're kind of hypersocial. And I actually have my, my niece, it's true, my, my niece has Williams syndrome, and interestingly, she's the daughter of two physicians she was followed at the University of Iowa, and she wasn't actually diagnosed with it until she was five or so. They tend to be very, very cranky babies, but then very, very social older kids. And, um, uh, very uncomfortable going out with my niece in public because I, I was like at a swimming pool in Chicago and she just goes up and starts talking to people, like people she's never met. She's like, hi, my name is Blank. It's hard to, you know, and looking at the <laughs> conferences that they have these national meetings where all the Williams kids are together and all, you know, they're all hugging you know, <laughs> each other. And it, 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 it's, it's kind of funny, but it, it, is, it is really, it's a, it, you, I don't know what gene that is, but it, 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 it's related to Williams syndrome. They're kind of hypersocial. The other interesting thing a lot of these syndromes, you always try and find out, well, what are the strengths of these kids? And the strength is, for whatever reason, these kids tend to be very musical. And they have, perf they have the, many of them have perfect pitch, and they have a innate sense of pitch. And so at a lot of the camps and stuff, they really emphasize music for these kids. And they tend to be pretty delayed. They, um, there are a, one or two Williams kids who have kind of went to, gone to college with a lot of help, you know, they have three or four people, like friends, who kind of keep an eye on them through college, but often you know, they, they they can work at things like you know, just check out desks and things like that, supermarkets or bagging supermarkets, but tend to have pretty reasonable amount of development delay. From a cardiac standpoint, these can be about the most difficult patients that we take care of, especially the babies. Uh, these are babies who, or uh, patients in general, who do not do well with sedation and do not do well with anesthesia. And so their risk of um, arresting with like induction in the OR is very, very high. And we've had a couple patients uh, who we have said, you know, we have warned everybody this patient could arrest in the OR, do everything, and they do it anyway. And so these are patients who sometimes if they don't have a diagnosis, will die in the dentist chair uh, with getting gentle sedation. So whenever you hear Williams, I think high risk with doing anything to them, especially especially kind of conscious sedation types of things. We need to be very, very careful. The heart problem, again, as I said, is supervalve aortic stenosis. Branch pulmonary aortic stenosis is it's a vasculopathy, it's an arteriopathy. They also have, can have hypertension. And so, um, and some of them just have really small abnormal vessels, some of them have coarctation. So this woman has had a couple aortic valve replacements and now came in, uh, got admitted to the adult side with heart failure, 
abortion and shortness of breath, lots of edema. They tried to, we tried to die a research and ended up kind of putting into renal failure, so we had to back off on her diuretics. So um, she was cast and she had kind of a medium gradient across her aorta valve. And she has really high filling pressure, so her end diastolic pressures were like 20 or 25. So you see these patients here when we have left atrial lines. Um, and so the really question is, how much will she benefit from an aortic valve replacement? And we just, because her com she probably is sick for a combination of things, she probably has some abnormal relaxation of the heart, which increases those filling pressures. She probably has some degree of stenosis of the aortic, of the, her aortic prosthesis. The other challenge is that she's got a small aorta, so they may not be able to put much bigger of aortic valve in. So this is a patient who's going to be pretty sick postoperatively, and I think what we would expect to see in her, especially things related to having high filling pressures, so she's probably going to have a lot of pulmonary edema. She's going to be difficult to manage from a diuretic standpoint. In the setting, having some degree of developmental delay and kind of dealing with her on the ventilator and all of that stuff. So. That's going to be a little bit of a challenge because it's going to be kind of a high-risk patient who I think it's going to be kind of sick. So it's hard to know, especially what to think, what to anticipate. But I think they appear, uh, just you know be aware of what Williams syndrome is and be aware of her indications of surgery. I think we just don't feel like we have other options for her besides trying to make her valve as good as it is, as good as we can make it. Tim, you had mentioned, but are both of these? folks inpatient on the adult side right now? Yes. Can you speak to why the decision was made to bring them here versus operate on them on the adult side? Yeah, so um, it is the uh, American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, have a recommendation that for certain defects, certain surgeries should be done by congenital heart surgeons. Uh, in both of these cases, it's for the aortic valve, maybe not, but uh, for the pulmonary valve, it's recommended pulmonary valve replacements be performed by congenital heart surgeons. And so, because uh, survival is actually better. Uh, if anybody remembers Tara Caramelou, Caramelou, who was a fellow here a couple of years ago, a surgical fellow a couple of years ago, and she. <laughs> yeah, so, see. Yeah, we know her. And, and so. She um, she did a study a, few, a couple of years ago now, where um, where they looked at outcomes like nationwide the congenital heart surgeon society or the STS surgical the, the thoracic uh, surgeon society uh, and showed that there are better outcomes for almost all congenital heart surgeries if they're done uh, adult congenital surgeries if they're done by congenitally trained surgeons. The other thing they found that. I don't know the precise number of that, but the vast majority of surgeries done on patients with congenital heart disease are actually done by non-congenital surgeons. So something like 75 or 80 percent of surgeries are actually done by regular, and that's kind of nationwide. They're doing things like this in what we consider pretty small, low-volume hospitals are doing ASDs and doing various other things. Uh, but um, that's why the recommendation is it needs to be done by a congenital heart surgeon. I think that the where to recover them is that we are at this point structured that if it's a congenital heart surgeon, they almost always recover here. The surgeons like like our, our ORs, they like our unit, they tend to recover people here. We're working out a little bit of a process for certain patients to be operated on over there and recover over there where, for example, Ming or Dr. Bobade would do a case with one of the adult surgeons and then it would recover over here. Um, I think the first case, the tetralogy case, I think will be a relatively routine pulmonary valve replacement, uh, and I think that that should be okay. I think that on the, the woman with Williams syndrome, I think you could make a case either way for her to be either place. Um, I think from a standpoint of her having developmental delay uh, and being a patient who has kind of been followed in the system, that's something which we do here and we'll understand her problems and probably maybe do a hair better than the other side and from the standpoint of her medical management in terms of you know potential thing for dialysis things like that you know she you could you know if she's an adult dialysis patient she might be better over there but I think it's because uh, you know I think Ming is going to do both of those cases and probably prefer that they come over here initially 
they get admitted to the other side because they're both greater than when they come in. They come in with a non-surgical issue. They come in through the ER. If they're greater than 25, they have to go to me. Uh, so that's why they got admitted, and they both both got admitted to the adult cardiology services on me because the residents, the pediatrics residents here, will cannot take care of anybody greater than 25. So that's how they ended up over on the adult side. And what's been happening is they are on adult cardiology service, and um, we consult on them. So okay. the adult congenital, which is Mark Norris right now, has been doing that just because I've been busy doing other things. So Mark has been consulting on those patients. Uh, one interesting dynamic is that for the Williams syndrome patient, Karen Goldberg is his primary cardiologist, and she has been involved too. So this, there's been multiple hooks in this broth, and she asked us to consult mostly because she didn't feel that the adult cardiology was, uh, cardiologist was doing what she wanted, and so she wanted another person to tell them what to do, too. And so now everybody is involved in their adults, emails going back and forth. But the, in that case, the adult cardiologist is the one who is really in charge of the patient. They're in patient under service, so they're really supervising the physician. Everybody else is a consultant, so um, that's how that is kind of do you, does the adult congenital heart team admit patients over there? Are you ever the primary service? We do not have a service per se. I do have, atten I do have admitting privileges, so I theoretically could. Mm -hmm. The problem, there's a couple of reasons. The problem, one of the problems is who takes care of the patients overnight. Okay. So with, if you have a service, you have to have coverage overnight. And so would you, who would you have cover? It's just not physically possible to have, you know, any one of our pediatric guys who can't have that unit fellow do it, you know. Uh, but uh, could you have one of the adult cardiology services take the care of it? But it's not really fair to say, we'll take care of the patient during the day and you can do the night mm -hmm. part or the weekend mm -hmm. part. We don't have quite quit critical mass of attendings to really have a service. You need four or five attendings to have a, uh, to, to support a service just in terms of it's painful to be on call more than every fourth weekend or whatever. So uh, that you need critical mass of four or five, preferably five. So if somebody's away, you still have four. Okay. All right. So we don't have a service at this point, but we do, do it more as a consulting service. Okay. Well, we're about out of time. Anybody have any questions for Tim? No? These will Thank be you. interesting yeah. cases later. Tim's flying up to Marquette today yeah. for three days. Yeah, I have to go to Marquette. And then I get to be on call again on Friday night. Oh, my goodness. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, thank